To uh, those that are able to join us here, isn't it exciting to kind of be able to see some other people while we worship for those here in the in the facility? Um, it's good to see. Yeah, it's good to see people. And you can see all the other beautiful things that have been added to it, part of the uh, Forward and Faith campaign that has been going on. And hopefully you heard the difference in the sound quality while you were hearing that uh, first song. So it's all exciting things to see. We also are really excited to have uh, those that are joining us online uh, be able to join us with us uh, corporately as we're worshiping here and as others are worshiping in their homes. Um, we know that uh, that this is this is difficult times from a standpoint of you know for some people this is not enough uh, togetherness yet, and for some people this is maybe going too far too fast. And and I would just ask for your grace as a leader here at Crosspoint. Uh, as one of the elders, um, and as we're trying to navigate our way through being the most wise we can with the information we have, and yet being able to uh, to not give in to fear in different ways, and really be able to get together and start gathering uh, in, a, in a smart way. So 
uh, thank you for that. Uh, it's, it's nice to see the people here, and it's nice to have you online uh, join with us here, too. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a great time together. I know for myself, too, and I'll ask you the question, have you been taking advantage of this time, of the time that we've had uh, a little bit more gathered uh, in our neighborhoods rather than out and about and with other people? Um, I know for us as a family, we've gotten some really great opportunities to interact with our neighbors. We've had uh, uh, the opportunity to minister to one of our neighbors who, uh, who lost his wife during this time. And so that's a, uh, you know, was a challenging time for him and uh, it's something that we can be ministering to him and really share uh, Christ's love through, uh, through our neighborhood. Um, also, we've been having great opportunities to interact with uh, each and every one of our neighbors on an almost daily basis, right? So take advantage of this time. Take advantage of this situation. Use it to honor God. You know, we all bear God's name, and we are all um, Christ's uh, ambassadors out in the neighborhoods we have. And so take this opportunity to, uh, to share Christ's love. Mike's going to be talking a little bit more about bearing Christ's name and, uh, and honoring Christ's name. Um, in, in the message here. So uh, to kind of kick us off this morning, I'm going to read from James chapter 3, starting in verse 7. All kinds of animals, birds and reptiles and sea creatures, are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings. Who have been made in, God, in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So as we go into our time of, uh, of, of, of worship and, and things like that, we just pray or we ask that you contemplate what is uh, how we honor and, and bring glory to God through, through our, our voice, through what we're saying, what we do. Um, pray with me here now as we, uh, as we focus in on worship. Dear Father, we just thank you for the ability to gather together, um, to, uh, to start to see each other again. We also pray for, uh, and, and pray for those that are gathering with us in a virtual manner, that we continue to take advantage of uh, the new skills that we've developed through this time and, uh, and ways to communicate and get, gather and uh, impact those around us. We pray now that as we focus in on this service and, and the message that you have through Mike, that you would uh, focus our hearts on you and focus our hearts on honoring and praising your name. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Eric. I am excited that we're able to be here today. And as we've said a number of times, thank you. As we've said a number of times, this is different. In fact, it's very different for us as we've been for the last number of months providing worship through just the live stream. And so even the worship team, it's, it's kind of learning new ropes again as we get people in-house worshiping together. Um, one of the things that's changed over these last months is how we've taken care of offering. Our offerings uh, have been online or they've been people sending in the funds, um, and uh, we've really appreciated that. I know that it's been tight. We've seen some cuts uh, in the last couple of months. We were doing really well first, and, but we know that people have been struggling. And so we want to continue to lift up our people, lift up uh, your needs. Um, one of the things that's changed is we won't be taking an offering by passing the plate anymore, passing the bag here. Instead, at the back are two boxes that are mounted on the wall. Um, so there's basically there's three ways that you can give for Crosspoint for your offering. You can give online still. You can give by sending it in the mail, and some people prefer to do that. Or if you want to bring cash or a check, you can actually drop it in these lock boxes. Less people having to touch or handle it, it will be collected and counted from those boxes on a weekly basis. And so that's one change that we are making. Um, with that, some other changes that are happening are in regards to connections. I'm going to ask Rebecca Marshaw to come up. <clears throat> Rebecca took on uh, a new role uh, recently, and right as she took on the new role, 
is when we had to shut everything down. And so she took over the connections team from Marsha Drew and um, Rebecca, I think, like we had one meeting and, and then everything shut down, right? And so uh, we've talked about what changes would need to happen around the building in order for us to start live worship. And Rebecca's been integral in that discussion and in the planning of it. And if you were here this morning to help with that, thank you. Um, it's going to take an army of people that you're going to hear about in a minute. But um, Rebecca, share just a little bit about some of the differences. Before we had, we had ushers and greeters, and, but we had some new roles that have had to develop and some changes around the building. Can you just share a little bit about that? Yeah, so one of the, the biggest changes is going to be our room hosts. And so we need um, two room hosts. We need one for the sanctuary and one for the fellowship hall. And that's going to be taking attendance. And that's very important because we need to keep track of who's here, and if we ever um, do have a, an outbreak, we can track it back. So that's, that's another important role. Um, the other important role is somebody to help with the cleaning. And um, we have somebody in, the, um, in front of the bathrooms okay. keeping track of who's using the bathroom. We can only have one person using the bathroom. We don't have coffee, so that's going to help a little bit. But <laughs> But, but also just making sure people um, are social distancing, people are wearing masks. Um, we don't want to be a police force. We want this to be a pleasant experience, but we also want to be safe about it. So it's been a little bit challenging, Pastor Mike, but I think we'll get through it. It's just very encouraging to see everybody here. Um, I just thank you guys so much. Yeah, I think you mentioned it takes between 12 and 13 people each day. I'm getting a lot of feedback that you guys can pull me down a little bit. I'm pretty hot. Um, about 12, 13 people each Sunday just to address those needs. Um, and so if you have an interest in helping with that, whether you're here or if you're online and you're saying, when I come back to in person, I'd like to help, uh, get a hold of Rebecca. We're going to have some information posted on our website so you can know more about what those roles are, what those needs are. Um, and then one of the things that she has mentioned was about masks. So uh, as elders have talked about this, we are encouraging, strongly encouraging people to wear masks. You notice that myself and the worship team aren't just because of where we're placed and there's enough distance that uh, we're okay with that. We're not requiring someone to wear a mask. There's a difference. What we're saying is, is that we strongly encourage it and if it's a reason that you have for a medical reason that maybe you can't, maybe you have asthma or some other things that make it hard to wear a mask, that's okay. Uh, but the one time that we are going to require masks is with the singing. And the reason for that is because congregational singing can, uh, you get, everybody gets, even though you're Norwegians here, you get excited, right? And, and the singing can cause the spread of spit and other things that cause the virus. So when it gets time for the singing, we're going to ask you to put your masks on. And that's another change that we made is we put the congregational singing at the end of the service rather than the beginning. It'll be the last thing that we do before we leave and we, and we go out. So um, if you would like to help out with that ministry, I would encourage you to get a hold of, of uh, Rebecca, find out more about it. And uh, Rebecca, if you could give that mic back to Eric. And uh, would you join with me in prayer for this morning? Father, I thank you for Rebecca, for Brad, for others that have been involved in the planning, the elders that have been involved, that have been involved in making sure that we are doing all that we can to be a safe place. But also, Father, we've got this desire to be back together again worshiping. We thank you that we could do that today. We pray for your hand of protection over this body, that you would be with those that are here, those that are at home, and protect us. And then, Father, we pray that one day soon, we would be able to gather uninhibited and unhindered to worship you together again. We ask this in your name. Amen. One of the changes we make every summer is, is that our children's ministry stops meeting during the summer months. So that's nothing new for this year. Um, but we do a children's message during that time. Um, and so kids, if you are at home or if you're present here, we're going to ask you to stay where you are. Normally I'd have you come all up and sit with me. You'll notice that the front platform is temporarily gone. 
Um, that's because of, in order to get the sound system uh, uh, installed, we had to be able to access underneath the platform. And one last change that's going to happen, as soon as the funds are made available through the Forward in Faith, is that we will be replacing the entire carpeting in the worship center. So there's no more playing connect the dots from the coffee spots. Um, so once that's done, the new platform will be installed and carpeted at the same time, and we'll have that back together for that. But children, if you'd stay where you are, and uh, if you're at home, gather around the screen a little bit for a children's message. And one of the questions I have for you is, do you know your family name? We all have a family name. It's an important name. Do you know your family name? There's another word for that. It's a small word, S-U-R, sir, your surname. And all of us have one. My family name is Richards. My name is Michael Paul Richards, and my family name is Richards. My name of my father is Jack Richards. My grandfather was Thomas Howard, or Howard Thomas Richards. All the way back, there is a line of Richards out there. And I went online to try and find out some information about my family name. Interestingly enough, that you, when you go on some of these, they aren't exact on stuff. They told me on there that my grandfather only had one, one child, and it was wrong because he totally dismissed my dad. Um, I'll have to try and correct them on that at some point. But I did find out that the name Richards is a family that settled in, they were a Welsh background that settled in England. Now we've got another side of the family, my mom's side, and their family name is Weirs, W-E-H-R-S. That's a total different group. They settled out of Germany. And then if you go back into our history, we've got stuff all over the place. Uh, we're not a real clean group. We've got crossover from a lot of different groups. But your family name is important. It tells something about who you are. When I was a child, uh, I would come home like some kids and I would say, Dad, I really want to go and do this. And he'd look at me and he'd go, Nope, you're not going to go and do that. And I'd say, Well, wait a minute. My friends are, my, you, you've heard it, right? But all my friends are doing it. So and so is doing it. And my dad, like most good fathers, would turn and they would say, but you're not so-and-so. In fact, a really good father would turn and say, they don't bear my name. You bear my name. And out of an honoring of myself as your father, will you please honor my requests in regards to these things? Our, our name, our family name is important. And kids, if you've not talked with your parents about it, I encourage you to take some time and sit down and say, tell me about our family name, our heritage, and learn about that. We're going to be finding out about another name that we all have as well today, a family name. It's an important name as we move into our time with the message. I encourage you, if you have your Bibles with it, that you'd take your Bibles and you'd start out by opening up to Exodus chapter 20. This summer we've been taking a look at the Ten Commandments which are found in Exodus and in Deuteronomy and we're going to be taking a look at commandment number three today that was given um, and it's about a name. What's in a name? What's so important about a name anyway? You already heard that my family name is Richards but I have two other names some of you say, well, you got more names than that because we'll give you some. Uh, but uh, I have two other names. My first name is Michael. And my middle name is Paul. If you dig into what the meaning of those two names are, it's very interesting. The name Michael comes from Hebrew, and it means, it's a question actually that's asked, who is like God? Michael, who is like God? Now, before... God let me got, get big-headed about being named Michael. He gave me a second name through my parents, and that's Paul. And Paul is a Latin name that means 
little. So if you put the two together, it just means that I'm a little like God. See, a person's name is a description of their character. It's a description of something important about them. In fact, for a, a parent to sit down and be having a new baby come and to sit down. How many of you, you've gone through baby books. I know that you guys have a baby coming up, right? You put out on Facebook, we, ought, we want the name to start with a J. But here's a whole about, you tell us what you think, and you've gotten some people giving you feedback on that. A name is so important. We had a family growing up near us. It was a farming family. They had 13 kids. All 13 of the kids were named with the letter D. Mom's name was Grace. (laughs) Our name is important, and a person's name is vital. When we think about the name of God, one of the theologians named Grudem says this, A person's name is a description of their character. God's name is equal to all that the Bible and creation tell us about God. God's name tells us about his character. And today we have the privilege of not only knowing God's name, but about making God's name known. We can know God's name and we can make his name known. Exodus 20 verse 7 and Deuteronomy Eric, can you do me a favor? I left my glasses down there. And Deuteronomy 5.11. Thank you. And these are identical passages. Exodus 20, verse 7. You shall not take the name of your Lord, the Lord your God in vain. Stop. You shall not. When God says don't do something, we'd better pay attention, Right? You shall not take my name, he says, in vain. To make God's name vain means that we make it empty, hollow, nothing, worthless. To take God's name in vain means that you're saying that it is useless. And there are a lot of ways that people take God's name in vain. One that comes to mind with people right away is Oh, this is talking about swearing, right? In fact, there's a story of a little girl that when she went to Sunday school for the first time and they started to talk about Jesus Christ, she was confused. And then she was able to talk to the teacher and the teacher later was instructing, well, this is who Jesus was. She goes, oh, he's a real person? I thought it was just something my dad said when he was mad. You know, we, we use God's name as a swear word often in our society. Whether it's God or Jesus Christ, we, we tag that on with sometime when I pounded the hammer over my thumb or if I'm in traffic and I'm angry. Or it comes off of our lips so flippantly. Most people really have no idea what they're even saying by it and the intent of it. What if they were to, you know, my, my dad's name is, is Jack Richards. What if instead when I hit my thumb I'm yelling Jack Richards instead of God, right? Man, there are a lot of ways that we can take God's name in vain, making it empty, nothing, or worthless. First off is with either no thought at all or with ill intent. This is where the swearing would come in, a curse word. When something frustrating has happened and God's name becomes an expletive that we evoke damnation on someone or something. Ooh, do you really want to call God's name down on somebody? When we use it like a habit, it's also taking it lightly. For example, rote prayers. Now, there's nothing wrong with a rote prayer, but there's everything wrong with a rote prayer that's being said because it's a religious fix. Because I'm just saying the right words. The Lord's Prayer that we're going to talk about later on today, Jesus never meant for the Lord's Prayer to be a verbatim prayer that we prayed in order to have said the right words. And so when we use God's name, it can't be either just flippant or just this religious ritual that we're trying to accomplish. We 
We need to approach his name reverently, not as an expletive, not as something that is just thoughtless. Another way that people can take God's name in vain is to use it without thought as to its importance. For example, making an oath or a promise. If you, you have to go to court at any time. Maybe they're going to make you say an oath that what you're saying is true. And see, they used to, I don't know if they still do, but they put a Bible out there, put your hand on the Bible, and you swear, right? But do you do that with thought? If you're using God's name in an oath, are you doing it with thought? One of the ways that I personally am involved with that is in regards to when people get married. And when people come to me and they ask, Mike, would you... Would you meet with us and would you do our wedding? First of all, I, I require pre-marriage counseling, pre-marriage coaching in regards to that relationship before they get married. But one of the things that we sit down and do, and Josh, I, I sat down with you and Chelsea and we talked about this. When you stand up and you're making a covenant commitment for marriage, that commitment is not something that you're just saying to each other flippantly. It's not something that, well, I'll commit to this until something better comes along. Because the commitment you're making is to make a statement to God. You're making a statement that says, God, I want you involved in this marriage. I want to give myself to this person like you would give yourself for us. That covenant of marriage is something to take very seriously. And it is not something that you break. Flip it. Now, there are, there are some situations that God says, I give allowance for divorce. But he also says in the same breath, but it grieves my heart. It's not pleasing. So to use it, God's name without thought to its importance is to take it in vain. Another way that we take it in vain is to claim to be speaking on God's behalf. Sometimes people will do this, they use it to, to evoke God's power or His blessing on what their desires are. A phrase that maybe you'll hear people say, and it, there's nothing wrong with this phrase, but there's sometimes something wrong with the way we use it, is in Jesus' name. If in Jesus' name is a closure of your prayer that you're thinking it's just going to wave some magical wand over it and now you're going to get it blessed, you're, you're taking His name in vain. It's not what prayer is about. By and large, prayer is about how I'm changed. What is God doing in my life? Kevin DeYoung in his book, The Ten Commandments, it's a great little read on the importance of the Ten Commandments, why they matter to us and how, why we should obey them, he makes this statement. He says, be careful when insisting that every Christian agree with you when you use a phrase like, God told me to or God wants us to. He says, we must be careful about claiming divine authority. How well do we really know the intention of God? If you're going to make a statement like that, wow. And I've heard people use it out of a desire to impress, not to impress on others the importance of their position. And this position should be what every believer holds. Now, we have something where God tells us what His Word is, what His intentions are, what His will is. To go is to me. And often we hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us about things that need to change and develop in our lives. So we have to be cautious that we don't enter into a serious infraction of the third commandment by claiming God's name to advance our own agenda. Wow. The examples like these can show us how we can take God's name into vain and make it empty, nothing, worthless, useless. But how can we know about God's name? It's easy to rattle off the you should not or will not do these things. But it's a whole lot more difficult to know Him how can we know God's name and how does that change things? Let's start off with what the name of the Lord is and how instead of making it vain, we can make much of it. 
How we can honor it and magnify it so that others can know His name and they can make it known. Today, we look at three specific ways that we honor the name of the Lord, God's name, our Father. And we obey the greatest commandment to love God above all else. Remember, that's what Jesus said when they came to him and said, what's the greatest commandment? He said, really, there's one command, love. And it's in two directions. You love God above all else with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you love others as yourself. So we're going to take a look at how we can honor his name by obeying this great commandment. We have the privilege of not only knowing God's name, but about making it known. I want to point you to three different names that are spoken about God in Scripture today. First one is we're going to take a look back at Exodus chapter 3. If you're in Exodus 20, just turn back a little bit to the beginning of that book. <clears throat> Exodus 23, if you're familiar, Moses wrote the book of Exodus along with the first five books of the New Testament. And Moses, in Exodus 3, <clears throat> talks about how he's keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the, pre the priest of Midian, he had led his, his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb in the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked in beyond and the bush was burning and yet it was not consumed. Can you see this? You've heard this story even from like, like child, right? Moses and the burning bush. And he comes up and the bush is burning but it's not going away. It's not consumed. What's going on in this picture? And as he steps up to see it, to take a look at it, he hears this voice that says, Moses, Moses. He said, here I am. He said, do not come near. Take off your sandals because the place that you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. You know, the place that you're standing is holy ground. Interesting. We are sitting in a building right now. It's a building that is holy at this moment because the people of God have gathered here to worship His name. But it's still concrete and brick. In this situation, there was a spot that God declared was holy. Why? Because His presence was there. He got Moses' attention with the bush. And then he got him to listen. And as he starts to talk and interact with him, he starts to share more about what he was going to do. And he was going to use Moses to release the people from this slavery that they were under in Egypt. And as he starts to unveil his plan, Moses starts to say, but wait a minute. You're sending me back there to talk to them and... I ain't sure if they're going to listen to me. I'm not sure if they're going to pay attention to what I have to say. Who should I say sent me so that they know that they should listen? And God unveils this miraculous name. Now, it wasn't a new name, but at this moment, he unveils his name in a way that was unique that had not been revealed yet. Verses 13 and 14. The Lord said to Moses, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God, then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, the Lord, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. The one whose name is the family name has sent me to you. This is my name forever and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. The name that he gave him was the name that is unspeakable. He declared that he was 
the self-existent one, the one who has always been. No one created him. There is no one that said, let me make God, right? He existed forever and for eternity. This name that's used over 7,000 times in the Old Testament is the name Yahweh. Spelled in such a way that it could not be spoken. And when they were reading scripture and they would come to it, it was so holy, so set apart, so much that they honored it, that they would not say that word. They, trans- they put in a different word in its place. Adonai. Adonai was the first name that God gave when we look back into Genesis and, and, and Adam is interacting, inter- interacting with God. God said, I am, period. That's who you say sent me. The name God gave Moses was a name that was, could not be spoken. In the beginning of the English Standard Version, they talk about some unique translation things that they've done in the Bible, in this Bible. And one of the things that they say, I don't know if you ever looked at your preface to your Bible before the Genesis part of the Bible. In the English Standard Version, it talks about different things. It says this. The translation of biblical terms referring to God in the English Standard Version takes great care to convey the specific nuances and the meaning of the original Hebrew and Greek words. First, concerning the terms that refer to God in the Old Testament. God, the maker of heaven and earth, introduced himself to the people of Israel with a special personal name with the consonants for which are Y-H-W-H. Scholars call this the tetragrammaton, and the Greek referring it to the four letters Y-H-W-H. The exact pronunciation of this was uncertain because the Jewish people would consider the personal name of God to be so holy that it should never be spoken aloud. Instead, the name of God to be spoken as it was read would be read with the Hebrew word Adonai, or Lord. What if we took that type of an approach to our respecting the Father's name? I am that I am. He and he alone is God. He and he alone is worthy of worship. And there's a problem. The problem is is that we like to go out in the playground and play King of the Mountain. When I was growing up, we used to pile the snow from the parking lot of of the elementary school into this huge mound. I don't know what they were thinking because if kids see a huge pile of snow, they're going to climb it, right? And we'd go climbing up that thing and play King of the Mountain. And if you could stay on top, you're the top dog. Here's the problem. The problem arises by that those who were made by I am, the one that is self-existent, who were made in his image to reflect who he is, to reflect his reality, they believe they can climb up to the throne on their own selfhood and arrogantly say, I am. And we forget that it's through I am that we are. Ouch. So the first name that we need to remember to honor is the name that is unspeakable, the name that is deserving of our worship. Second name. It's the name Lord. Here's another interesting thing. If you're reading in your Bible... You ever notice sometimes the word Lord is spelled capital L and then lowercase O-R-D? And sometimes it's spelled capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D? You ever see that? There's a reason for that, and it goes back to translation. Because when they would speak the name of the Lord, God, His personal name, that's the capitals. Lord, the supreme name. In order to worship God as the Holy One, we must know God as supreme. 
Adonai, Lord. And because God is supreme, he deserves respect. And so we've got God, the self-existent one that deserves our worship, but now we have God, the Lord, supreme, that there's no one above. And because of that, he deserves our respect. When you talk to people about bowing their knee before him, sometimes people get upset. They say, well, wait a minute, I, I don't want to bow my knee to anybody. I don't want to submit. A lack of submission to the one true God is one of the greatest sins that we can commit. In fact, it goes back to the garden. Pre-garden, when Satan, Lucifer, that was created as a being that was to bring glory to God through music, decided, you know what, I'm going to rise up and I'm going to be like the Most High. And God said, think again, buddy. There's only one Lord. There's only one that's supreme. God is supreme. He is to be respected. There is no one greater. Now those two words give us a high level of God. But the third name, the third name is one that brings him to a personal level with us. The name is Abba. It's actually only used three times in the entire Bible. The first one is found in Mark chapter 14, verse 36. Mark 14, 36. Jesus, this is a situation, Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross to die for our sin. And he's, he's to the point where he's, his heart is breaking. He's saying, I, I know I need to do this, but I don't want to do this. And as he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, it says this. He leaves the disciples, he goes on a little further, and he fell, falls on the ground, and he prays that if it were possible, this hour might pass him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Abba. Jesus uses the most intimate term that he could use for God. And he calls him Daddy. Wow. Through Jesus, we're given another opportunity to know God. And it's not as this God that is on his throne that we can't approach. It's the God who broke the barrier between us so that we can approach him and we can crawl up on his lap and we can sit down with him and we can say, Daddy, tell me about my name. Right? See, declaring God to be personal and able to be known is where it becomes real. And you can talk to people and say, you know what, you shouldn't swear, you shouldn't use God's name. But if they don't know him personally, it really doesn't make any difference because they're separated from him already. And you can talk to people about, you know, you shouldn't take oaths lightly. You know, you should, you should be careful how you use God's name in an oath. But if they don't know him, it doesn't matter. They've already entered into that oath or that relationship with an if as long as it's okay for me, then I'll hang on to this. But when you know God is your daddy, you want to honor that name. You don't want a word that you say or an action that you do to go against your father. That's why in the last few Months, I've had a couple of situations that have been brought to my attention where I've said something that tore down my father's name. And humanly, the very first response that I could have in those situations is what? Get defensive. But I was justified. 
but I was right. But instead, when I think of my daddy and having dishonored his name, my heart's broken. And I want to pursue correcting that situation. When Jesus was meeting with the disciples and they said to him, they, they saw his relationship with dad. He said, teach us to pray. Do you remember how he started the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. When we pray, hallowed be your name, we are praying that people would speak about God in such a way that it's honoring to Him and that accurately reflects His character. This honoring of God's name can be done with actions as well as words. For our actions reflect the character of the Creator who we serve. We have the privilege of knowing and making God's name known. We can know God's name because it's holy and worthy of worship, not even be able to be spoken. We can know God's name who is supreme and worthy of our respect. And we can know God's name which is personal and worthy of intimate relationship. But how do we make it known? We make it known when we apply Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. See, we have the privilege of making God known through our words and our actions. And when we think about the third commandment, it's not an issue about not swearing. It's about every word that comes out of my mouth, every action that my hands do, every thought that my mind thinks, is it in line with the character of God. The commandment to love God first and foremost is heard through how we use His name and it's seen in how we live under His reign. Mankind was made to reflect the image of God. We need to allow Him to bring reformation to us so that we can properly reflect him to others. When our words and actions align with the name, the name of God, we demonstrate that we know him and we effectively make him known to others. For me, this puts an entire new perspective on things like, what do I post on Facebook? How do I respond to that person? Why? If you know God and you have received His Son, Jesus Christ, as your Savior, you are granted a new name. You are Christian. And that is a name that we must honor and uphold. God has granted us the honor of being adopted into His family and bearing His name as Christian. So that the command, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, is a command that we do not dishonor God's reputation by either the words that we speak being foolish or misleading or by actions that don't reflect His character. God's name is yours. Honor it and reflect it well. Please join us in worship. Only a God like you, only a God like you, only a God like you. Only a God like you, only a God like you, only a God like you. Only a God like you, only a God like you. Only a God like you.
God like you, only a God like you, only a God like you. Only a God like you, only a God like you, only a God like you. Only a God like you, only a God like you, only a God like you. Only a God like you, only a God like you, only a God like you.
Do you know the name that God's given us? Do you know his name? Take, take his name out into this world, into your neighborhoods, into your, where you live. Reflect it, honor it, give it its due. He is great. He is greatly worthy of our praise and honor. His name is great. And we get to bear it. Take that responsibility. Take it out. Go. Go this week um, into your neighborhoods, into your workplaces, and show his love to those around you. As we kind of close out our service here, I just want to thank you for joining with us. It's been great to see those who are here It's been great to participate and worship with you that are online with us um, and to share this time together, bringing praise and honor and glory to his name, to his name. So gather with us again next week as uh, as we have the opportunity to get together here, but also online. Uh, Join with us. Um, We look forward to seeing you again in one way or another. Um, And as uh, uh, for those here, uh, encourage you. Uh, as we leave, you know, gather if, if you want outside to chat with people. We know that that's much safer than here in the facility. Um, so just take the opportunity to do it that way. So go with Christ, go and honor his name, and share his love with your neighbors. In your name we pray. Amen.